so I, I moved to the United States in 1971 as immigrants uh, with my Japanese family, and I ended up in the outskirts of Detroit. And most of you are probably too young to remember 1971, but that was when uh, the Japanese car companies were putting the American car companies out of business. So I went to a school where I was the only Japanese kid, and half the school were unemployed auto workers kids who used to chase me around and call me Jap and make machine gun sounds and occasionally would beat me up. And uh, it took a while, but I, f I forgive them because I, I think they just didn't know any better. But what happened was um, my, my parents were oblivious because they were both working at a company called Energy Conversion Devices. And it was founded by this amazing guy named Stan Ovshinsky. And he was a Ukrainian Jewish immigrant uh, who grew up in Akron, Ohio. And he worked on a machine shop floor. He never got to graduate from college, but he invented the automatic lathe and then the automatic transmission. And he was spending his early years as a radical. Um, he would uh, start labor unions. He would speak up against racism. But then he realized that he was, it wasn't scaling. And in 1960, he created a company called Energy Conversion Devices. And he believed that the inequities that he was fighting against, the inequities of information and the inequities of energy, and he actually minted a coin with this on each side, that this could be solved by science. So he dedicated the rest of his life to science. He studied neuroscience, and then he tackled this um, problem of these inequities. And so he, he invented the first amorphous uh, photovoltaics, the nickel metal hydride battery, the first um, optical memories, phase change optical disks. He has over 400 patents, and several years ago was inducted into the uh, Inventors Hall of Fame. But my parents were working in this wonderful f company, and uh, as a kid, I grew up with uh, rooms full of uh, Nobel laureates and pipe cleaners and, and, and styrofoam balls and people shaking them, talking about them and the molecules. But because we were in Detroit and because he came from the shop floor, we also had the unemployed machinists from the local factories working with us. And the machinists and the, me the mechanical engineers with the tooling grease under their fingernails were just as important as the Nobel laureates in the inventions that we were making. And, <laughs> and and for me, you know, getting beat up in school versus hanging around with uh, professors talk, explaining chemistry to me while they were making uh, ice cream, uh, I decided that science was more for me. And so for me, you know, science was all about that. It was, it was about um, uh, uh, machinists. It was about uh, wonder. And, but it wasn't easy for Stan. Stan had built this amazing little uh, uh, enclave of scientists in, 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 uh, near Detroit. But in the early days, when he first came up with this, uh, his first invention was called a amorphous threshold switch. And he had a working prototype for 10 years, but everybody thought it was a hoax because he had no credentials. But then finally, a renowned physicist at MIT named David Adler looked at this and said, this is a thing. This is the, the beginning of the field of amorphous studies. Webster Dictionary put a word in the dictionary called Avonics for Avshinsky Electronics, and he finally was able to get his credentials. But it was very, very difficult for him as a working class scientist to actually crack into the system. Um, but you know, I think what's important as um, you know, we, we think about um, all, all of these things is how, it, how we need to think about science is more than, um, than just the credentials, and that, that was my childhood, but I was, I was working in this uh, company, and one of my jobs was connecting the computers together, and I was underage, I was child labor. Um, but, uh, but as I was hitting high school, I discovered the internet and realized there were people on the internet that were smarter than my high school teachers. And um, I dropped out of college and started an internet company. As somebody whose job it is to convince people to finish their degrees, I will tell you that anything that I was able to do was not because I dropped out, it was despite the fact that I dropped out. And I urge everybody to finish their degrees. And, and especially if you're not a rich white person in Silicon Valley, it will always be better if you have a degree. So don't, don't, don't follow my example, okay? Please. Um, but despite that, you know, I, I, I was there in the early days of the internet. We were building the internet. 
Um, and we thought that connecting everybody together would create this world peace. If only people could talk to each other, everything would be fine. Sir Tim Berners-Lee created the web to connect um, academics together so that science could be free. So back in the 80s, we thought, you know, we were at the dawn of an amazing new age of science. And it didn't turn out that way, as you know. And so, but you know, it's, it's amazing. Think about it. We have the world's knowledge at our fingertips. But about 40% of Americans still don't believe in evolution. Um, climate science is still considered controversial and political. And so I wonder, and I ask you, why do you think that is? And I think it's because we've left some people behind. I think that there are a lot of people who, when we were in Detroit, we engaged everyone. And as a city, Boston, where we have 400,000 students coming in, we have 80 colleges and universities. We just heard that half the cancer uh, drugs were invented here in the last five years. We are probably the most learned city in the world. And so I think, but I think it's our responsibility to make sure we're not leaving everyone behind. What's pretty, you know, and, and you know, in the 60s, remember back to the moonshot in the 60s, the president galvanized America under a dream of science. Everybody was into it. Even when I was in Michigan, I remember because I was the president of the Model Rocket Club, there were still echoes of kids who loved science. Somehow that feels like it's fading. So I think that what we need to do now is, in the 60s we had a president that created a call to action to, to pull the country together under science. This time we have an attack on science. So this time, we shouldn't take that attack and cower in fear. We should take it as a challenge. We should take it as an opportunity. It's amazing, you've got all these scientists who have left their labs to walk out here in the rain. We've got all of these people who care about science marching all over the world. And, you know, I, I think it's our, not only our opportunity, but it's our obligation to take advantage of this energy to come together. And so if you are a scientist or even if you're not a scientist, reach out to somebody in a different school. Maybe be adventurous and reach out to somebody in a different discipline, but maybe actually be really adventurous and reach out to the people who aren't here today, who aren't excited about science, but don't sit and argue with them. Share your passion. Get them to join the team because that's the way, and, and I think the trick is we've got to come together under a passion for science rather than fear, fighting, and arguing, and I think we can do it. Thank you.